the retinoid are the larger cartilages. They're basically <coughs> attached to cricoid cartilages, the posterior aspect, kind of shaped like a right triangle. Attached to that and superior to it are a smaller pair of triangular shaped cartilages, which are the corniculate cartilages, and then the cuneiform, or more anterior, embedded in the soft tissue, also paired. Then we have, as you know, some folds, the interior of the larynx. Superior ones are the true, excuse me, the inferior ones are the true vocal cords or vocal folds. These basically are elastic ligaments. They vibrate when air passes over them. This is what allows us to basically make sounds. You notice they're covered with stratified spring septinium. And then we have these true vocal cords basically are attached to the retinoid cartilage at one end and the thyroid cartilage at the other. There are muscles that move these, and that's what changes the stretch or tension on the cords. So this is what allows us to change the pitch of our voice. When it's stretched, just like taking a string, an instrument, if you tighten it, that increases the pitch. If you loosen it, it decreases the pitch. As far as the sound, the loudness basically has to do with the force of air rushing over. So the louder sounds, more air rushing over. Softer sounds, less air rushing over. But again, it's the pitch that has to do with the tension on the vocal cords run between the retinoid cartilages, posteriorly, to the thyroid cartilage, superior, or anterior. And the superior pair are the false vocal cords, or the singular folds. They're not involved in sound production, but they aid in breath holding. They come together. They also help to keep things from going down into the larynx or into the trachea, but not involved in sound production. As I mentioned in the lab, the part of the larynx which is superior to the true vocal cords is again lined with that same protective lining, non keratinized stratified squamous that we see in the oral pharynx, the ringal pharynx, the superior part of the larynx. And then below that, it again resumes as pseudostratified ciliated condoptinium, which persists in the trachea and the bronchi as well. The larynx, since it lies between the throat or pharynx and the trachea, of course, carries air between them. It also helps to keep things from going down into the trachea. And also because of the, the, the vocal folds or true vocal cords allows to produce sound and because again of the pseudostratified ciliated condyloctinium, the inferior part helps to filter air as well. The trachea then, this inferior and attached to the larynx, it too is supported by cartilage. And of course it's going to branch into the right and left primary bronchi which carry air to and from the right and left lungs. It too like the lower part of the larynx, is lined with pseudostratified ciliated condyloctinium. And again, you've got the mucus creating goblet cells here, just like you've seen before. So it acts to filter and moisten the air as well. And as you saw in the lab, from the models, it is supported by T-shaped pieces of cartilage bed of the wall and again for the same purpose to keep the tube from collapsing but the posterior aspect between the open ends of the c-shaped piece of cartilage is a muscle and this is called the trachealis muscle when it contracts it basically reduces the diameter of the trachea which is a more forceful expulsion of air and usually this happens when you cough when you cough, of course, you're trying to dislodge something that went down, and with a more forceful expulsion, you're more likely to kick it out. So that contraction tracheus muscle basically allows for more forceful expulsion of air when you cough with this contraction. Also, too, because it's more flexible than the cartilage, and since the esophagus lies just posterior to the trachea, it allows expansion, or at least partial expansion, of the esophagus into the trachea without collapsing the trachea. So it allows you to swallow larger pieces of food. The 
a few there. As I said, the primary ground feed, French off, the trachea. And actually the right primary bronchus is shorter than the left, it's wider, and it's positioned more vertically. And for this reason, things are more likely to get trapped, inhaled objects that is, on that side, the right side, than on the left side because of the shorter length, the wider, and a more vertical position. Again, the primary bronchi lined with the same type of epithelium we see in the nasal cavity, the nasal pharynx, both part of the larynx, the sinus stratified, the ciliary clumping up the feet. So again, it's warming, moistening, filtering the air. These branches are secondary lobar bronchi. Since there are three lobes of the right lung, we have three on the right, and two lobes to the left, and two on the left. They subdivide into tertiary or segmental bronchi, which basically go to the segments of the lungs. And these bronchi then divide into smaller and smaller bronchi. And eventually, the smaller bronchi divide into the bronchioles. Now the bronchioles passageways are usually a millimeter or less in diameter. So they're very small. The bronchioles then in turn divide into even smaller ones, which are the terminal bronchioles. They're usually about a half a millimeter or less in diameter. And again, they're so called because that's the end of the conduction zone. These in turn carry air to and from the respiratory bronchioles. They branch off the terminal bronchioles and then feed air into the alveolar ducts, the alveolar sacs, but again, the respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and of course the alveolar sacs are composed of alveoli, and not the wall. Of course, the alveolar sacs are just clusters of alveoli. Now, as we descend the respiratory tree, we see some changes occurring. One thing is the amount of cartilage in the wall decreases. You go from the large cartilages you have in the larynx to the P-shaped pieces in the trachea, and you have piece of cartilage, smaller pieces in the primary, and even smaller in the secondary, and smaller yet in the tertiary. And by the time you leave the bronchi, the cartilage disappears. So the cartilage ends in the tertiary bronchi. Of course, have elastic fibers in the walls of all the bronchi, as well as the bronchioles, so you have some resilience there. That's one thing, decline in the amount of cartilage as we go from the larger to the smaller respiratory passageways. Another thing is the amount of smooth muscle in the walls actually increases as you go from larger to smaller, which means the smaller passageways are capable of changing their shape more than can the larger ones because of the contraction of the smooth muscle in the walls. So you get vasodilation when they relax, vasoconstriction when they contract. A third thing that we see is a thinning of the epithelial lining of the respiratory passageways. The epithelium changes from pseudostratified ciliary columnar epithelium in the lower part of the larynx, the trachea, and then the bronchi, and eventually goes to the simple cuboidal by the time you get to the terminal bronchioles, and eventually the simple squamous when you get to the alveoli, which of course facilitates gas exchange. So a decreased amount of cartilage as we go from larger to smaller respiratory passageways, increased amount of smooth muscle as we go from larger to smaller passageways, and then a thinning of the epithelium as we go from larger to smaller passageways. And like I say, by the time you get to the alveoli, it's just simply a simple squamous. Take a look now at the alveoli. And the alveoli, you can see, are very numerous and very small. You see that by looking at lung sections. In fact, in a normal human lung, we have something order about 300 million. The net effect, of course, is to greatly increase surface area for gas exchange. And 
average adult human lung, we have something order of 70 meters, 70 square meters of surface area, which is rather astounding consider the size of the lung. That translates to about 750 square feet, about enough to cover a tennis court. We just have two bags with two tubes going in, primary and bronchi. We have very little surface area for gas exchange. So a net effect of all these alveoli, these small little chambers, air sacs, is to give us much more efficient aeration of the air. And again, they're all composed of simple squamous epithelium. There's a thin elastic basement membrane as well. So it's very little tissue that the gas has to cross. The alveoli, of course, are surrounded by a dense network of capillaries. They're either called alveolar or pulmonary capillaries. And again, very thin wall here. A little bit of loose connective tissue, that's the basement membrane and simple squamous epithelium. So this facilitates gas exchange as well. The alveoli epithelium consists of two types of cells. The type 1 alveolar cells are the ones that actually make up the walls. And this is simple squamous epithelium. The type 2 alveolar cells secrete a fluid and they're scattered among the type 1 alveolar cells. That fluid, the alveolar fluid, 